Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Kenichi Soga from UC Berkeley. Uh, thank you very much for joining this first TC105 Geomechanics from Micro to Macro Seminar uh, series uh, entitled Discrete Element Method in Geotechnical Engineering Education. Uh, this particular seminar series was sort of planned uh, within the uh, ISSMGE TC105 member committees. We thought it would be good to do something uh, under this pandemic that we all cannot meet, but then it will be good to sort of a showcase what we're doing within TC105 and then promote the idea of geomechanics from micro to macro. I see a lot of people are joining today and thank you very much. I'm sure you're very busy, but it would be great to have you from all around the world. Uh, this particular uh, uh, seminar will be recorded. So for those who cannot see it, you can see it later on on the recorded version. Just to go through uh, what we are aiming for, and then within this next five months or so, we're going to have a series of lectures from our colleagues uh, in the area of how do we use discrete element method in teaching geotechnical engineering teaching. And we approach a variety of experts and uh, hear the list of the experts who we agree to give the, uh, the lectures. Uh, lecture one is today by Dr. Francois Gillard about uh, entitled Teaching Granular Mechanics with Discrete Element Method. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have Francois. Thank you very much for uh, joining. Uh, next week, uh, ne next two weeks from now, uh, from on February 22nd, we'll have um, also from University of Sydney by Benji Mark, Dr. Benji Marks, uh, talking about virtual laboratory testing using DEM to understand soil behavior. And then we have additional three more coming later on in March, April and May. So if you do enjoy, please join and, and uh, listen to the other lectures. The lecture will last for about one hour or so, uh, probably a little bit less for question and answer later on. If you do have questions, please put in your chat window. Also, uh, if you do want to talk in person, then uh, you can raise your hand and maybe if we do have time, I'll allow um, anybody who want to ask, to ask questions. Uh, today, it's my really pleasure to have uh, Dr. Franz Guillard from University of Sydney. He is part of the Particles and Grain Laboratory at School of Engineering, uh, Civil Engineering at University of Sydney. Uh, originally from France, but then uh, really an expert in discrete element method. And I'm sure you can go to his website and see a lot of fancy stuff. But uh, today, uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time uh, sort of uh, me talking. So Francois, I'll leave the floor to you and then you can start your presentation. So let me unshare. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kenichi. I'm just going to share my screen. Yes, it's good. All right. Hopefully everyone can see that. So yeah, so, thanks a lot, Kenichi, for the for the invitation and, and, and kind introduction. So um, yeah, as you said, I'm uh, Francois Guillard. I'm working at the, at the University of Sydney. And so we are going to talk today about uh, teaching granular mechanics with, uh, with discrete element uh, modeling. So um, one thing I want to mention from the uh, very get-go, uh, we saw the, uh, the lecture um, uh, list by, by Kenichi uh, earlier. So this work of the first two lectures, so, so mine and, and the one from Benji Marks, are, are really going uh, uh, together in a way. It's, uh, it's a lot of work that we have been doing uh, um, and developing together to try to bring a uh, discrete element um, really in the, in the education space and to make it easier for students to access and, uh, um, and some other tool, um, you know, to kind of improve uh, um, our teaching and, and improve the way we, uh, um, you, you know, we try to engage uh, students into, into their learning uh, in general. Um, so what I want to uh, talk about today uh, is, um, uh, as I said, uh, uh, teaching um, uh, particle mechanics uh, uh, from the point of view of using of using DM. So uh, the first thing uh, I'll do will have a little bit of a refresh on discrete element modeling. Uh, since I'm the first uh, uh, the first lecture of, the, of this series, I thought it would be good uh, to at least be on the same page on some on some, on some basics. And um, and uh, what I will show here is uh, actually uh, uh, things that I show to the student or that I that I, uh, that I lecture to the students. Uh, uh, about discrete element and about how, how things are working for, for discrete element. 
And then uh, we'll go in a little bit more detail on uh, how would you go at uh, trying to uh, implement discrete elements for students, or more precisely, how would you go at making tools available for students to uh, use discrete elements or to uh, uh, really get some uh, insight uh, using the discrete, uh, discrete element uh, method. And we will go through an example of uh, an assignment, actually, that I give uh, last year to the, to the, to the student in, uh, in a particle mechanics, uh, mechanics class. So OK, just a, just a quick refresher. I mean, uh, Quick, we we'll see how long it takes, but uh, just a refresher on what is uh, what is discrete element modeling first of all, and uh, why would you want to teach it? So I think I mean everyone here uh, is probably very well aware that uh, granular materials are uh, are ubiquitous. Uh, they are uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, of course, geotechnical and ge uh, geomaterials more generally are um, are uh, really made of of grains for for most of them. And so in that respect, it makes sense to try to uh, develop some numerical uh, method that would be able to describe individual grains and that would be able to describe their motion uh, as, they, as they flow. Similarly, there's of course many other materials uh, that are in granular forms, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know, uh, crops and things like that, pharmaceuticals are a very common example as well. So we have this, um, this uh, different kinds of uh, divided materials. And uh, so, of course, people have been developing numerical methods to actually uh, uh, describe the individual grains. And this numerical method, uh, which is a discrete element method, is uh, getting more and more used in industry. I think that's an important point since we are, um, I think, most of us teaching uh, students to eventually, uh, for the majority of them, or at least some of them, to go to industry. We probably want to give them some background on uh, on this kind of discrete discrete method. So um, uh, I went, for example, um, um, this is just example picture from a, from a commercial code, discrete element code, and so you, you see uh, uh, the ability to uh, uh, to describe non-spherical particles. You have the ability to describe crushing, or uh, even to go to more complicated uh, um, uh, grains and uh, fluid flows, which uh, of course are quite interesting in particular for chemistry and things like that. So all these kind of things um, uh, that are used uh, more and more in industry to be able to describe um, uh, granular flows in general and, and particle flows, and, uh, and of course, for some, uh, for some industrial, industrial applications. Now, from a teaching point of view, there was actually quite a few things that are uh, quite interesting in using, uh, in using discrete element. The first thing is that it's actually good, a good tool if you want to teach some particular phenomena. You can't always bring the student to the lab. In particular, in the last the last couple of years, it has been uh, uh, quite challenging to do that, uh, it's, it's at least in some parts of the world. So, um, uh, definitely having numerical tools that are able to, you know, replace or at least complement uh, experiments is uh, is probably a good thing. A good thing to have. The second aspect is that discrete element is actually a fairly uh, straightforward method in the sense that. It's uh, the numerical implementation is quite close to the physics of the phenomenon. You, uh, contrary to uh, finite element, for example, you don't really have to go to weak forms and uh, this kind of uh, you know, numerical development to get uh, into the actual numerical simulation. Really, discrete element is just implementing Newton's law. So that's a, a, a little bit more direct in a way uh, in terms of uh, numerical simulation. And the last part is that, uh, of course, if you are trying uh, uh, to teach your student more, uh, some programming, which uh, I think, I mean, I, I'm in uh, an engineering faculty, I think most of our students should know some basics of programming. And, um, and to, to learn that, you kind of need to practice it on some, on some program. And I think discrete element in that respect is not a bad, uh, is not a bad starting point or example program of, uh, uh, of something that you can, uh, that you can do or where you can develop an actual um, um, you know, simple software uh, fairly, fairly easily. So let's go um, just a little bit more on um, what I would consider the key aspects of, uh, of discrete element. And again, that, that's something that I teach uh, to the student in the undergraduate, uh, undergraduate level, postgraduate as well, um, all the way to PhD. I've been uh, doing this lecture. Of course, usually uh, I have like two hours here. I will condense it. In, uh, in 15 minutes, but uh, that's basically the, just the basics I want to go through 
uh, just so that uh, everyone is on the same page on, on, on uh, uh, the discrete element method, uh, uh, at least. So I think there's three uh, key aspects of, uh, of discrete elements. The first one is that you have individual uh, particles that are able to move, uh, uh, to move in space. And you are solving the uh, equation of motion for these individual particles. The second aspect is that uh, usually just one particle by itself is not very interesting. So you want to, uh, or you would have some collision, either, either collision between particles or collision with a wall or a, a, an object in your, in your simulation. And the last part, which is, I guess, uh, not strictly speaking, uh, a discrete element, but I, I, I still uh, like to talk about it, is uh, coarse graining. Discrete, the discrete element numerical simulation is going to give you information at the particle level, at individual particles. It will give you the velocity, the stress on the particle, uh, this kind of information. But most of the time, you want to go a level uh, higher and go more to the macro, uh, uh, macroscopic information of the material. And so that's what coarse graining allows you. So just to go a little bit into more details uh, on, on this one. So if we go, um, so of course, as we say, as, as I said, we want to look at the particle motion. So particle motion is very uh, straightforward. We have the uh, Newton's equations uh, of motion, and each particle in three dimension, if it's, uh, if it's a sphere, has uh, six degree, uh, six degree of, uh, of freedom of motion, right? Three degree of uh, motion in translation in the, the three direction of space, and three degree of motion in uh, in rotation. Okay. And we do have, of course, the Newton's equation for the translation and the rotation. And, uh, uh, and of course, that's exactly what we uh, want to integrate numerically, right? So uh, we need to integrate the uh, velocity. We have the particle properties, usually. That's, that's something that we give to the, to the simulation. We want to integrate this equation. And of course, we need some uh, information on the forces and some information on the, uh, on the torque that are uh, created on the particle or that the particle experience. So how do we do that? Like the numerical integration, we can use any numerical scheme. The most, probably the most common in discrete element is uh, the, the velocity valet algorithm. Again, I'm not going to go uh, into detail of that. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to, to everyone to, uh, to, to look it up. But basically, it's just a standard, standard algorithm. And again, it's really just a building block for, uh, uh, for uh, the, the student and for, uh, for, uh, for you to, to get started really with a numerical simulation. Now, in terms of the forces uh, between particles, so if we, have, uh, if we have collision between two particles, what are the forces uh, that uh, the particle will experience? A little bit. Okay, should be all right. So what is the forces that the, that the particle is going to experience? So if I have two, for, two particles, uh, colliding with um, uh, uh, colliding with each other like this one, well, um, the, there will be a force between them, and of course, with uh, Newton's law, we'll have uh, a, a force that is equal and opposite between uh, between the two particles uh, on each side of the contact. And typically, in a, in the uh, in, in granular materials, or, or when we when we simulate this kind of thing, we usually take uh, 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 the particle as interpenetrating uh, uh, between them. So we only consider that they are in contact when uh, their distance is lower than the sum of the radius. And uh, from there, we want to compute the forces between them. And the way you do, you do that is that you split this contact force into two terms, a uh, normal force that is uh, going through the center of the particles and a tangential force that is going uh, perpendicular to, this, uh, to the axis between the two, uh, between the two particles. So if you if you do that, the normal forces, it's uh, um, it's uh, fairly straightforward. The typical model at this point, you need to decide on a model for uh, for your contact force. The typical model for the normal contact is uh, a, an elastic elastic model with some viscous dissipation. So either you take linear elasticity, or you in three dimension you can go a little bit a little bit further and go to nonlinear uh, nonlinear elasticity. Now the important point uh, is that. Uh, in all that is to say that if you only have normal forces, you actually don't have any rotation of the particles, right? Because this contact force only goes uh, goes through the center of the particle, so it's not creating any torque on the particle. So the particle is not going to rotate if you don't have any uh, any tangential contact contact forces. And that's uh, 
quite important in uh, like thinking about granular materials and particle mechanics and, and this kind of thing, uh, because really quite often you want to you want to simulate some frictional forces, and for that you need some some tangential force. So how do you do that? Um, that's um, actually a quite quite more involved than the normal forces because now you need to uh, have to follow the tangential overlap between the particles to record that over time to see the evolution over time of this overlap, and uh, then again you need some uh, assumption on the force of the force models that you are using. Typically, you would use uh, uh, elasticity before the particle slips, and then uh, just uh, just uh, uh, a friction uh, a friction threshold for your uh, for your particles. So that's um, that's that, that's the idea. And as I said, now that if you uh, if you put these kind of tangential forces, now uh, uh, you do have uh, rotational velocities because uh, you do have torques uh, on your particles and moment on your particle, which are going to uh, which are going to change the uh, displacement, the, the, the rotational velocity of your particle, and uh, you will get a much richer um, a much richer behavior effectively because you have this kind of uh, 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 tangential forces and therefore rotation rotation as a well. Now, one aspect uh, um, that is uh, usually quite discussed quite a lot in this discrete element is, of course, how do you uh, actually consider the contacts between uh, between the particles? So, how do I know that two particles are in contact? I'm not going to discuss that too much because I don't think it usually matters that much in for our purpose. If you just do a detection, a typical detection uh, uh, algorithm, the most naive implementation you can have will run fine up to a hundred or a thousand particles. And usually when you are to this scale, it doesn't, like for students, really um, yeah, there's not that much point to go to much more um, number of particles. Things uh, like the, the efficiency of your contact detection algorithm is really important only when you go to very large number of particles. And this is usually useful only when you go to research or to really a specific pro industrial problem that you are trying to solve. So I'm not going to go. Um, to go there, I think the, uh, the naive implementation of the, of the detection collision is usually good enough for um, for a teaching perspective or for, 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 from a student uh, from a student perspective. So that's really the basics of uh, the discrete element simulation uh, um, model. So the most basic discrete element simulation: you have the particles that are able uh, to move that we integrate in time with a certain time step, and then the particles are able to collide. And have some force between them when this uh, when this happens. Now, one uh, as I mentioned, I do want to go one step further and to go to well, how do we go from the discrete particle information to the uh, uh, continuum to the continuum information? So, why do we need to do that? Because well, particles that are noisy, individual particles are colliding all the time. The velocities are changing all the time. So we are usually looking for a smooth continuum field, and I think that's uh, <laughs> like really kind of the uh, of the aim of the TC one hundred and five, right? To go from uh, microscopic information to macroscopic information. So, and I think coarse graining is one way to do that in the uh, in the in the numerical uh, numerical modeling uh, uh, field, effectively, right? So really, um, um, all what coarse graining is is uh, just a fancy name for spatial average. You are taking the uh, information you get from individual grains, and you are doing some kind of spatial average to get the, uh, the continuum information of the grains. And that's quite useful if you think about the, uh, uh, you know, geotechnical or, or geomechanical information, because this continuum information is what you feed into constitutive models, right? The constitutive models are trying to link your strain typically to the, to the stress. This information you can actually compare that to a discrete element simulation, from which, from the course graining, you get the field information, so the stress and the strain, and you can compare if uh, uh, if the two, uh, if your model is realistic given your numerical uh, discrete element um, uh, uh, numerical simulation, for example. And so the way to to do that, uh, uh, typically, if I want to go from the from the from the mass of each of the individual particle to something like the volume fraction or the, or the density, I will uh, uh, look at a certain location in space, take the grains that are within a certain distance of this location. So that's what we call a windowing function. 
do the average, do a certain kind of average and get the um, and get the volume fraction at this at this location of the key. Now, when I just say that it seems uh, fairly straightforward, but really there's a lot of detail on how to do coarse graining properly and 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 how to make sure that you have the uh, that you take the right information and that you don't uh, you don't lose it, uh, too much information while still uh, obtaining a meaningful continuum field. So there's quite a bit of uh, art or, or technicity in doing the course grading. So that's also something uh, to keep in mind that we may want to actually uh, to actually simplify a little bit uh, uh, for the students what we want uh, to show them and maybe not uh, uh, let them do everything by themselves, but uh, maybe guide them into uh, using a proper course grading tool and 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 do it in a, you know the most reasonable way while uh, still being uh, achievable for for them. Um, so that's that's also something that uh, I, I, I will show in this talk is that we we have developed quite a few tools to do that and to help doing the cross training even even for research. So uh, it's also something that I think can be uh, uh, can be useful in, in general. All right. So that's basically uh, the basics uh, of of cross training really, and um, and uh, oh sorry of, um, of dispute element and, and cross training in general. So now. Let's uh, let's look a little bit at uh, well, how do we teach that to our students, or really, what do we uh, where do we go uh, where, where do we go from there? Because as I mentioned, everything that I showed is typically things that I do in uh, in a lecture to the students, but of course, uh, it seems a bit a bit uh, sad to leave it there and not to have the student play with a natural numerical simulation. So we want the student to be able to actually do a discrete element simulation by themselves somehow. So how do we do that? So we do need some kind of tools to actually perform this uh, this discrete element simulation. And in my opinion, I count four main ways to go uh, to uh, uh, to actually open these kind of tools uh, to the students. So the first one is just to let the student actually code the uh, the discrete element simulation by themselves, right? From what every all the information I've given you. Uh, in the, in the first part of my talk, you should be able to actually code now a discrete element uh, simulation that will simulate grades, right? There's not more information that is needed. Of course, that can be hard, but in principle, it is uh, it is possible. That's, that's something that we discussed. The other thing is that, well, of course, you, uh, like as, a, as an academic or as a, as a teacher, uh, you may want to uh, code a discrete element model by yourself and uh, give it to your student. That's another possibility. Another one that is maybe more uh, convenient is to actually use an open source software, right? There's many more, or quite a few now very uh, well established and very developed uh, open source software that are uh, that are doing discrete element simulation quite efficiently and quite well. So that's an, another aspect. And of course, there are some commercial software, right? Industry is using quite a few uh, quite a few of these. Um, so maybe that's something we want to we want to consider. So we are going to look at this different aspect and see what are the benefits and the limitation of, uh, of each of these. Basically. One thing that I want to mention that I think it's, a, it's an important issue, um, even if it's not necessarily a very um, sexy one, in a way, uh, I think um, the hardware uh, question is important. So we have to keep in mind that uh, every student is going to have a different uh, computer, uh, computer brain, computer uh, operating system. Uh, uh, different different materials for, for themselves. So if you look at the at the left picture here, which actually I think was taken at the University of Sydney, you can see we have some students who are using a, a Mac laptop. We have some students who are probably on Windows laptop, uh, seeing what they look like. Maybe some students on, on Chromebooks. Um, some of them may not have actually a laptop and maybe using their phone. And of course, this has only been uh, uh, even uh, more important while, while we are uh, moving in remote into remote settings, right? Now we uh, a lot of our lectures, at least for us in the last couple of years, a lot of our lectures have been uh, remotely uh, or uh, remote only. So the students are at home; they have whatever uh, computer they have. Some of them may not be able to uh, afford very advanced computing uh, computers. So we may uh, want to make sure that whatever solution we choose uh, for uh, running a discrete element simulation, most of our like uh, all our students will be able to to run it reasonably easy, or at least 
that we are not leaving a lot of the students uh, uh, on the side just because they don't have the computer that, that fits uh, our, our, our needs. And the thing is, like again, there is a lot of options that you can go with in order to run to run a discrete element. The first one, which is uh, probably the most portable one, is to is to run uh, to run the discrete element in the directly in the student browser. So um, there's only a handful of uh, browser in operation right now. Google Chrome is probably the most the most common. And um, the good thing is that even if there's a few different browsers, they are all based on the same standard. So usually, if you have something running on one of the browser, you can reasonably expect expect it to run on a, on a different one. Then, of course, you can ask the student to install the software on their computer. So that would be the approach of yeah, install um, Mercury or install Lights or install Rocky DEM on your computer and run the simulation from there. But then, as, as I said, because all the computer systems are um, potentially different, you may, uh, you may have some hardware issues and some students not being able to actually install the particular piece of software that you are, that you are asking. Of course, what historically has been done is uh, that we have solved that, that by using by having computer labs. Right? University uh, uh, can have a computer room, so the university owns the computers, knows the hardware, knows the software, so you have a control on the hardware and software, and uh, that's uh, of course solves a lot of these uh, of these issues. But again, with the uh, uh, with the remote learning and the pandemic and all that, it's getting very hard to actually rely on students being able to come to a computer lab or to connect remotely to a computer lab, which, which can be tricky as well. And then the last option, which is um, actually not really uh, um, not that developed in, in discrete element, um, is to run on a remote server. So um, if you know like there's a lot, uh, for example, uh, Word online uh, exists, you don't have to install anything on your browser. You can just run something uh, uh, on the server somewhere and, uh, and uh, the, the, the servers give you the uh, results on your computer. And so you have nothing to install, nothing is run in your, you don't need any computing power really, you just rely on the computing power on the, on the remote server. So that's kind of the different, um, uh, different things you can do uh, uh, to try to um, uh, you know, help the student as much as possible in terms of being able to actually run a, a specific discrete element, uh, discrete element simulation. And so we are left with this kind of uh, landscape, really, where depending on how much you are willing to, uh, to help the student or to let the student uh, develop, or uh, how much you rely on the discrete element to actually work and give uh, tangible results uh, uh, by running an exercise for the student, you uh, basically will decide, well, do I want to privilege uh, uh, something that is simple to use and that maybe in a few hours or, or, or an hour, um, uh, most of the students will be able to run, so that would be more at an undergraduate, undergraduate level. And maybe for a postgraduate level where you have a bit more time or uh, um, uh, maybe in a, in a research component or something like that, maybe the student will be able to, uh, uh, to go to a bit more complex code. We'll have the time to actually uh, uh, learn how to use the proper code or to write their own, uh, their own discrete area. So that's the kind of thing that is important to consider uh, for, uh, for our students. So again, where does it lead us? So uh, we have all these different options. So let's let's explore a, a few. Of them. The first one I want to I want to discuss is a commercial uh, commercial one, um, and I will be very quick because I don't really use co commercial codes. But um, I do want to mention that there are, uh, of course, a few uh, commercial options which um, uh, have a lot of advantages. Right, there are, um, there are a lot of features, but probably some graphical interface. Uh, interface, some good documentation. Usually, the installation is very straightforward. Of course, the drawbacks is that you uh, you have to pay for them, so uh, uh, that's uh, certainly a limitation if you have a lot of students or uh, not, not a lot of budget. And they are usually black box, so you have less control uh, uh, as uh, uh, regarding the output of the, of the of the simulation. So as I said, that's pretty much everything I know about commercial softwares. Uh, I will uh, uh, for the rest. Oh, sorry, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, as I said, for the rest of the talk, I will just uh, focus on uh, on the other uh, three parts, which is where uh, um, uh, and myself have been doing quite a lot of development uh, in the last uh, in the last few uh, few years. 
So in terms of, um, I just want to mention a little bit the context where uh, are we or are, uh, am I personally teaching a discrete, discrete element? It's uh, basically within a course that is called uh, Particle Mechanics for Geotechnics. Uh, and it's a, it's a last year of undergraduate and it's also open to postgraduate uh, students. So it's uh, about fourth year of, uh, of university, something like that. And the discrete element is only part of this course. So it's uh, about two hours of lecture, which, as I said, incorporates the slides that I mentioned previously. previously. And um, a tutorials and a, a home assignment, which is, which is really kind of the core where the students uh, are learning, uh, are learning the, the, the discrete element. And it's a fairly small class, which also influences our choice of uh, our choice of tools uh, that I will show uh, that I will show in a second. So the, the assignment is, uh, is this one here, and um, uh, I mean you are free to uh, free to bruise uh, to bruise from it uh, all the tools that I'm going to show uh, uh, now. You can actually access them uh, to this uh, uh, using this link uh, here, and there's kind of quite a few. Um, uh, quite a few options here and, and quite a few um, information and tools. If you want to browse, by all means, um, uh, we are uh, very open in, share, in sharing these kind of resources because uh, we think it's uh, it's uh, quite interesting. And um, yeah, I'll try at some point to share the share the um, the, um, the slideshow with you, so you can also um, uh, use the link directly and click on the link uh, directly. So that's, um, that's the context. Now, how do we uh, engage students into um, actually uh, uh, seeing some benefit into discrete element? Really, um, as I said, we are uh, engineering students. They are not, they are not programmers uh, or they are not, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, computer, um, computer science students. They are engineer, uh, civil engineers. So uh, we need some kind of uh, problem that is actual, uh, actually uh, solvable using uh, discrete element, or at least can be tackled uh, using discrete element. So the problem we are using is uh, basically a very simple one of rock because it's actually um, it suits very well the discrete element. It's quite easy to implement, and uh, we can simplify it or make it more complex uh, depending on the, uh, on the on the on the need. And of course, rockfall is an important problem in, uh, in geotechnical engineering, right? Um, this is an example. It's actually in Sydney uh, uh, of uh, quite a few rocks falling into the sea here uh, at some point. And of course, it's quite quite clear. Um, we could simulate that by discrete element just by taking one rock or a few rocks and uh, dropping them on, uh, on, on some kind of inclined plane, which is exactly what uh, what we are going to do with the students. And of course, we can, we, can, we can build up from here. So for example, we can build up to retaining structure like this one or protecting structure more, more precisely like this one. And now, I mean, the, uh, the, the benefit of this element is clear. If I want to know how to build the structure, I need to know what, um, uh, what force, what maximum force is going to have to sustain. And to do that, I can, I can just drop a discrete element uh, rock on the, on the structure and see how much force uh, this structure is, uh, uh, will have to resist. All right, so that's um, that's the general context that we give uh, that we give to the student. And now the first part of the assignment actually, that I've shown that we ask to the student is to actually develop their own discrete element uh, code. There's a few advantages in uh, doing that, or a few benefits. The students have full control of the code; they are the one uh, uh, doing the work, and it's a good programming training. If we want the student to have some basics of programming, they should probably practice a little bit. And this is, uh, as I said, quite a good way. To practice, uh, to practice programming. Of course, you can't ask too much, in particular in a limiting time. You um, certainly, the, whatever the software the, the student produce is going to have a limited, I mean, limiting number of features. And also, there is this risk that uh, students will spend a lot of time actually doing the coding and not so much using the DM to solve a particular, uh, a particular problem. So that's why we kept it, we try to keep it simple in this particular assignment. So we simplify a lot the, uh, uh, the actual uh, situation. If you want, we just go two dimension, single sphere um, or single disk actually, dropping uh, on, a, on a plane here. So we remove any uh, idea of collision. We don't have any rotation of the particle as well. So that, that also simplifies quite, quite significantly. And, uh, and we ask the student to, uh, uh, to code this uh, discrete element. And you know, if you look in the, uh, in the PDF, you will see there's uh, a few uh, steps for, uh, that, we, uh, that we indicate to the student on, uh, on how to do that. 
And usually, um, um, you know, most of the students manage to get something that is um, reasonably working. And of course, now you can you can start playing with it by changing the height of the of the grain. For example, you can look at uh, 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 from from what point does the grain uh, actually goes above the uh, the protecting the protecting wall here, and uh, and this kind and this kind of questions. Now, one thing that I think, um, as I mentioned, I think it's important to keep in mind what is. Uh, realistic in terms of what the student can uh, can uh, program by themselves or not, and um, so as I said, for me part in particular, from what I've been teaching, I really just limited. Uh, uh, we are just limiting ourselves to simply translation and bouncing of a single code. If you want to go further, probably contact detection is not that hard to implement. If you if you if you follow the naive algorithm of just looking at all the pairs of particles. It's probably feasible um, in a reasonable amount of time. Three dimension, if you are limiting to uh, translation, is also, it's also something that is, uh, that is probably achievable. The hard part, really, in my, in my opinion, comes when you, when you go to, uh, when you are trying to get rotations and uh, more advanced shape and contact detection. Together. So this, this probably I would, re I would reserve to quite advanced uh, postgraduate, uh, postgraduate students. But yeah, so that's uh, basically uh, it for um, the students being able to uh, to do their own uh, their own discrete uh, discrete element model with some help, of course, but um, uh, in a fairly in a fairly good way. All right. So another option, uh, as I mentioned, is to have um, the academic or the, 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 the professor or the lecturer to actually uh, code a discrete uh, a discrete element uh, model that they will give to the student. So there's a couple of uh, the, the main advantage of that is that you have full control of the code, so you can do whatever you want and uh, have whatever feature you think is important for your for your course. You can put it in the uh, in the discrete element you are coding. The negative part, of course, is that this is very much time consuming. Right, you are uh, making a full discrete element is actually quite a, quite a lot of work, and because it's a lot of time, you will have a very limited set of features because uh, you won't be able to have the time to actually. Uh, to actually do uh, more than that. So I wouldn't recommend necessarily doing it. I think there's enough options out there um, uh, to actually uh, suit your need, like open source uh, option to suit your need, unless you have some very specific features that you can't find in any code and that you really can't, um, uh, can't include by using, uh, uh, by using uh, an existing code. And that's actually um, the, the, the reason I mentioned that is because it's actually the situation where we ended up uh, at some point a couple of years ago, we had developed a discrete element uh, software that was called N uh, NDDM, and we had developed it for, uh, for research. And uh, so it has one specific feature that is not really useful for most people, which is that it can handle any number of spatial dimensions. So one specific feature that we developed for uh, research, and then some basic DM feature, because you kind of need them. You can do whatever you do, you kind of need walls and uh, periodic boundaries and this, this, this kind of thing. So we ended up with this code from, uh, that, that came out from, uh, from research. And so we decided to, uh, uh, to actually try to see if we could use it for, um, uh, uh, for teaching, right? Which seems uh, like, a, like a reasonable uh, thing. The other aspect is that it actually has, uh, we actually developed, while do, developing this, this discrete element tool, we also developed quite an advanced course learning tool, uh, tool as well. So, um, uh, that will be very useful to, uh, to integrate with other, uh, with, other, with other aspects. Okay, so that's uh, what we end up doing. And what we end up doing is actually uh, having this uh, discrete element code uh, being able to run in the browser. So instead of, uh, of the student training some particular software, we uh, actually give, uh, uh, basically give a, a link to the student and, and you can actually uh, yourself uh, uh, go to this link. And it will run the, sim the uh, discrete element simulation for you in the browser. So it's using the computing power from the student computer to uh, run the discrete element simulation. So I do want to show uh, this simple example. It's kind of a rock fall, but probably closer to a long slide. So as I said, we have a limited, um, 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 limited features in the code. So it's only a plane with inclined gravity and periodic boundary conditions in, both the, uh, uh, the, uh, in, in, in the two horizontal directions. So if I click on this link to open a new page and I will go there, it takes a, 
a few seconds to, to load. So you should see on the right, um, uh, you can see grains uh, falling. We start just with a, um, uh, with a regular packing and we just let them fall uh, under gravity, as you see here. And, um, and so it is running the display element simulation right now in my browser uh, while I am, uh, I am talking to you, right? And so it's just broadcast through Zoom uh, to, to every one of you. So I can, I can rotate the thing around to look at the grains, uh, see what they are doing right now, the gravity vertical, so there's not, much, uh, there's not much happening. But you can see also that on the left, we have the real time coarse graining of this uh, simulation running. So we have the velocity field that is calculated as the center in black here, and the pressure field that is uh, again calculated at the center in, uh, in uh, blue, and the shear stress uh, in a dotted, dotted blue here. So obviously, nothing is moving right now. The, there's no, there's no uh, gravity vertical. So we just have the hydrostatic pressure, no shear stress, and the velocity is jumping around because there is some noise in the, uh, in the simulation. And now what I can do is, uh, of course, I can incline the gravity a little bit. So if I, oh, that's maybe a little bit too much, but if I go 24 degrees, for example, uh, here, so you can see my uh, flow is going to start. So really, uh, my discrete element simulation is running in real time. And you can see the velocity field uh, developing the normal, like the usual back null uh, velocity field. And you can see the, uh, the pressure uh, being fairly constant. I mean, the hydrostatic pressure is going to remain, uh, to remain the same. But we now have some shear stress, of course, because we have a friction uh, that, is, uh, that is mobilized. So I'm not going to, uh, to go much more into detail in that. I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice tool and, uh, because it is able to run directly the simulation in the browser and the course running at the same time in real time. And the, the student can interact directly with them. And you'll see a, uh, quite a few more examples of this, of this particular um, setup or, or, or system in, uh, in Benji's talk in, in a couple of weeks. All right, so that covers uh, that uh, covers pretty much um, uh, what you can do if you own the code and have all the um, uh, basically all the all the control over uh, the discrete element code that you are that you are running. But now, as I said, it's still a bit limited in terms of uh, of your features because it's limited to whatever you are willing to implement and have time to uh, uh, to implement in the in the discrete element. So how do we go from there? Well, of course, we would like to use an open source software, right? There's, there are very good open source software, and, um, um, and, and we might as well use it. So the first way to do it is actually to not use a discrete element software, but to, to use a physics engine. Physics engine has been developed quite a lot for games and things like that, and, uh, and they can be used uh, uh, for, for this purpose. So this is just a little bit of a toy model, really, just to, uh, just to illustrate this. Hopefully it will uh, uh, it will run, but uh, basically we have coupled uh, uh, the discrete element from a physics engine into uh, um, uh, with a topographic map. So um, uh, hopefully in a second the topography is going to load. Sorry, the internet may be a, a little bit slow, but um, but the idea is that you are going to use the actual topography of a particular location uh, you are interested in. And you will run uh, the grains at this particular location, and they will be able to fall uh, uh, to fall under uh, under the cube. I think the, the the internet is a bit uh, is probably not uh, quite right here, so it's not quite working at this point. But technical issues that's uh, that's why uh, demonstration usually work when the students are not here. So that's the case here. This this was working half an hour ago. It's not working right now, but that, that's all right. One of the things is that that's definitely an option to run this, but it's probably not the best, uh, not the best option to use a physics engine because physics engines are made to run quick, right? They are made for game. It needs to run, uh, to run in real time, which means that the physics is sometimes a little bit, um, um, you know, fuzzy, or at least uh, there are some tricks that are made to make things run efficiently. So really, what we would want is to use an actual discrete element code. So uh, there are quite a few uh, open source one. Um, these are probably the main, uh, the most, the most well known one. And there are there are a lot of benefits in using uh, an open source software. Uh, they usually have quite a lot of features, in particular this well established one. 
they are cheap or even free, depending, depending on the option you are, you are using. And the code is available. So if you want to play with it or uh, implement some new, some new things, then, uh, then of course, um, uh, you are able to do so. Now, there are some issues. And the main ones, uh, in my opinion, is that usually they have quite a steep learning curve. So it's not very easy for students that would have a limited number, of, uh, limited time in particular, like in specific unit, to actually get into an actual discrete amount code and run it by themselves and install it by themselves. It can be very much, uh, very much time consuming and fiddly to do that, uh, uh, to do it that way. So what we did instead is we develop a front end for uh, for this code. So we use the Mercury DPM just because it's the one um, uh, we are uh, most used. Uh, uh, with, uh, with Belgium myself. And we develop uh, an interface that the students are going, uh, are going to face where basically they will be able to run a specific simulation that we have set up with some parameters that they may have uh, some control on. And, um, uh, and, um, and yeah, so they, they will be able, so basically they don't have anything to install. The drawback of that is that it is running uh, remotely, so it's uh, going to depend on the computing power that you are uh, that you yourself as a, uh, are going to spend on the on the server. So that's why for it's probably better for smaller class. It can be scaled up, but um, uh, but clearly that's something you need to think about in advance in terms of how much computing power you will need for the student to run that uh, to run that comfortably. So let me show you a, a little bit what this, uh, what this uh, gives. I'm just going to reload this one. And so right now I'm just going to, I'm not going to run the, um, uh, the, the whole simulation. Uh, I'm uh, just going to try to reload, uh, to reload the, session, the session by itself. Again, it's probably going to take a second. But as you see, so this is uh, a, a discrete elements that are already being calculated uh, using Mercury on the server, and so that's pretty much the same, uh, the same simulation. Uh, sorry, the same geometry as what we were asking the student to uh, to build. So just with a slope and um, and uh, and a wall here. Except now, because it's a full discrete element software, we have many grains, and we are contact. We have a re a realistic contact interaction between the grains. Even if the grain shape is probably not quite rocks, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's it's quite nice. And so uh, we can run that, see how the grains uh, move around. Hopefully, it's not too jerky in, um, in, in Zoom, but the grains got removed immediately as they go above the wall here. Um, uh, but as you see, now the student don't have, uh, can just uh, uh, look at the flow and get some information. For example, we can, we can ask, um, and that, I think that's one of the questions in the assignment is actually to, uh, for the student to say, well, how much um, uh, how much uh, uh, material is left behind the wall uh, uh, at the end, at the end of the, at the end of the, uh, sorry, of the rock fall, basically. So it's quite an interesting, uh, an interesting thing to look at. And as you see, we are uh, also uh, letting the student download some um, uh, some information about the forces on the wall, and we ask them to do some some more of calculation with uh, uh, to to get this this kind of information. And as I said, one of the interesting parts is that, OK, right now I just loaded uh, data that was already here. But uh, uh, we can actually play with some of the parameters here and, uh, and change them and let the student actually, uh, actually decide on what they want. I'm just going to go, uh, just not to overwrite the, um, the information here, I'm just going to go and do a, a, a small, um, you know, uh, another simulation. Maybe I'll do a 15 degrees slope angle and very small number of grain because I want it to run reasonable time. And we just let it run. And so now, as I said, that's where the computing powers uh, uh, come into play because this is running on a single board computer at my home, which has, doesn't have a very, uh, good or very uh, impressive computing powers. So it does take a while. So uh, as you see here, hopefully, uh, I'll just continue a little bit on the, on the presentation. Hopefully, when we come back, it will be, it will be finished. Now, of course, one of the uh, things, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, coarse graining is a very important uh, part of discrete element. So now this information that we got from the discrete element, can we run them uh, through a coarse graining? So that's something that we haven't actually asked the student to do, to do yet, but that's a tool that we have developed in the last few months. Uh, and so my, maybe this, this semester, we'll, we'll try it with the student. So I will try, um, I will 
also try to demonstrate it uh, uh, here. So this is just the, 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 the random initial thing. But what I will do, I will just load the file from the simulation that I just uh, calculated. Uh, so probably, so I am just going to load a few files here. You probably can't see what I'm doing, but uh, as you see, I've loaded uh, uh, quite a few, um, like a few time steps from the simulation. And I'm also going to load uh, just some parameters from the from the uh, course graining. As I mentioned, course graining, you do have quite a few parameters that you have to decide on uh, how you want to do the course graining. For example, well, well, which field do I want to course grain? I want the density and the velocity here. And uh, uh, of course, some other uh, properties uh, of uh, what windowing function I want for the course graining and all this kind of information. And so now that I have that, I'm just going to run the uh, course running and what you see now if I manage to get it in frame. So you can see this is a course grain field of density for the um, uh, uh, for the simulation that we have seen previously. So you can see here where the grains were created at the top of the cliff, the uh, the flow, and uh, some of them are retained here uh, with uh, um, uh, by the wall. So now it's no longer the discrete information; it's already the field. Of, uh, of density. And so if we, if we keep going further in time, as you will see at the end, the, uh, the rock falls here uh, stop in front of the wall, and we just have our left with a zone with, uh, of course, higher density of grains behind the wall, the, the protective wall that is just keeping the grains, uh, keeping the grains in uh, and, and protecting downstream a, a little bit. The, the field. So that's uh, basically where we are at in terms of the, of the course graining. And, um, and I think this tool, um, uh, actually, I don't think this tool even exists for, um, uh, for research or anything. I haven't seen this tool, I think, from, uh, for this redeemment. So I think it's also something that can be useful if you're more interested into using it uh, uh, to process your discrete element uh, uh, data. I think that's, uh, that, that can be a good, a good addition in your, uh, in your toolbox. Um, let's just uh, finish by just having a look if the simulation has run. Yes, it, uh, the simulation has uh, finished here. You can see the slope is a bit higher. I've, I've taken uh, 15 degrees here. And again, much less grain. As I said, I, I had sorry, I had only 10 grains uh, uh, in the simulation here. And uh, they are very bouncy, bouncy but um, uh, as you see, this is a simulation that has run right now. And that has just been served in my, uh, in my screen so i don't have really anything to uh, do as a student i don't have i really the only interacted with the simulation in terms of just a few parameters that i'm able to change and um, that could be the start of the parameter study for example or, or, or something like that all right i think we have done we have gone through the all the different uh, different options so um uh, i hope i haven't been uh, too long but as i said there's a lot of options that uh, that uh, need to be adapted to whatever your needs are, what your students need are, and what are you, the learning objectives that you that you have uh, for the for the student. As I said, I think this, these tools hopefully are uh, are engaging, and I, and I think the students do appreciate uh, when you to, when you try to engage in, in this uh, in this kind of thing. Uh, by all means, if you want to contribute ideas or if you have ideas, if you want to uh, deploy some of these tools. Uh, uh, and, and need helps, by all means, just uh, feel free to contact uh, myself or, or, or Benji. Uh, for that, we are more than willing to have this uh, used as much as possible. And as I said, stay tuned for uh, some other virtual uh, tools uh, in, uh, in Benji's uh, presentation in a, in a couple of weeks. So thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take questions. That's well, thank you very much. And I see Benji's face as well, so uh, maybe Benji can join the discussion. We'll have about sort of a five, 10 minutes uh, for a question and answer. I see some of the questions on the chat, so I'll just go one by one. One is that uh, from us, Alessandro saying that, can you suggest any textbooks about DM to be used at undergraduate or postgraduate level? Do you use any textbooks? Um, I don't really use uh, much, much textbook. Uh, there is a... Um, uh, there's of course uh, quite, uh, quite a few of them um, that I lose uh, the title right now. There was an allergy to material uh, book on discrete element that was that was quite good, probably more for a postgraduate uh, level. Uh, that was probably three, four years ago, maybe something like that. 
uh, which could be uh, which could be a good one. And there's a, there's some uh, classic ones that I, I think. Um, mm. uh, Benji, my, Benji my Catherine was also Liban, I think, uh, as as one of them, uh, which is which is quite good. Yeah, thanks, Bertrand. Benji, you're okay. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say I, I don't really have any suggestions, yeah. but thanks. thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joel is asking, uh, what are some of, some of the must-have features to look for in an open source sort of code? Ooh, that's a very hard, <laughs> hard question <laughs> to answer because it really, it really depends what you are, what you are looking for. Um, yeah. If you are looking for an open source code that, uh, that student can use, uh, I would say the ease of installation is probably one important one. Uh, having a graphical user interface will be really uh, 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 an easier sell to students in, in most of the case. Uh, so, so that would be the main two. If you uh, if you are looking more in terms of, of, of research or for trying to decide on what what code to use for research, I mean the three I've cited are probably the most the most good one and, and reasonably you can uh, you can go with them. Uh, if you have some specific features, I think that's really the, the point. If you have some specific, like usually that's, that's how it goes, you have a specific thing that you are really trying to do. If that is the case, then it's good to check that the code that you are going with is going to have it or to have the possibility to, to implement it. Um, I think that's the main, the main thing. And if you are trying to run a really big simulation, if, say, if that's your aim is to run a million particles or something like that, then it probably needs to have a good uh, parallelized implementation or something like that. So also something to look at, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Ali Reza says, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, his question or her question is, uh, is there any limitation for choosing contact models in 2D or 3D? Uh, also regarding particle shapes as spheres, polygon, polygonals, and all those things. Um, well, I mean, it depends what we call that, what we call limitation, right? It depends which kind of uh, physics you are trying you are trying to um, to, yeah. to, to to simulate. Um, um, I th I think I mean, as I said, the code that we have developed the uh, NDDM code is actually just using a hook law for the normal contact, which in three dimension or higher dimension is probably not not, not the greatest. Um, but you know, if the if the Global effect or is the emerging effect from the from the large number of particles is uh, is um, what is dominating that then it's probably, it's probably fine. Um, so yeah, it really I think it really depends uh, depends the problem and what you are trying to show because maybe it's uh, you want to look at adhesion and then of course you need you need to have the, the right load for that. Um, regarding particle shapes, um, that's uh, not really something I've looked too much at to be honest, uh, but there has been quite quite a lot of developments. Um, going from sphere to um, ellipsoid or sugar quadrics uh, in particular, which uh, allow you a bit more freedom in terms of in terms of shapes and having more uh, polygonal or polyhedral uh, 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 particles. Um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's a whole work of that um, uh, body of work or <laughs> literature of that, uh, uh, of course. Um, so yeah, that's something. If that's something that you that you want to use. Uh, then again, some codes do have this implemented already um, from the get-go. Uh, I know lights do have uh, super quadrix uh, by itself, so that's something that you may want to, to, to look at. And there's always a possibility in most code to actually have um, uh, what's it called a clumped particle, which uh, basically by stucking, sticking together spheres, you kind of can approximate a, a, a lot of shape with this, with this method. Really. Has some drawbacks as well, but yes, that's another option in most in most of existing codes. Yeah. Do you go into contact physics like a spherical spherical particle leading to hertz Lindlin or that kind of a things, which is really physics based and understanding the physics of contacts? If you have particle which is sort of angular and then you have contacts are different, so so that's an interesting physical phenomena. Do you go into that? Um, in a, well, if you wanted to do a, to do a discrete element that uh, that has yeah angular particle, you 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 do need to go into, the, into this, mm. this kind of thing usually. Uh, I definitely don't go there with the, with the students. Uh, to be honest, I don't even go into. I think I think I think uh, the 
so, so it's a shared lecture uh, um, really the particle mechanics that we that we are teaching and and and, and i think uh, so itai naf is doing the, the, other, the rest of the course uh, actually goes into the derivation of the, of the hertz lean, i believe or at least part of the of the okay. derivation on, on that so so Nanda has a question if the software that you're presenting can be run compiled with Windows, iPad OS, or is it based web-based app? Yes. So uh, I think pretty much everything I've shown is uh, either, um, so everything that is running in the browser here can be run on any, um, any uh, OS really. Right, as long as you have a reasonable browser, so Google Chrome or Firefox are probably the main two uh, where things have been tested for us. But uh, as long as you have one of these, it's uh, it's going to run uh, probably reasonably well. The last part that I uh, that I showed, uh, which is uh, um, uh, this thing, the server side is running on Linux, uh, just because it's a bit easier to compile Mercury on Linux than on any other any other uh, hardware. Um, but yeah, all the interfaces are working, um, are basically uh, always agnostic in a way. So uh, that's, that's also something that we were uh, quite careful to be able to run, to run that in, in uh, pretty much any different, uh, different computer. And that's something we have tested as well. I think uh, between uh, Benji and I, we have all the different OS possible. <laughs> so, so things get tested in, in, in different ways. Yeah, uh, we're a little bit more over on three minutes. So maybe we should close the session for today. And uh, I see other questions up. Uh, if you can really email Francois, maybe he can answer your questions. Uh, I'm very sorry, I can't go for every questions. Uh, Benji did say that uh, there is a links to uh, this uh, website that you can have a look and it's a good way to start. And I see Sydney Group has been really front runners to teaching DM in actual education, starting from undergraduate studies to graduate studies. So look at their examples and hopefully you can use them. And I think Benji is going to tell more about that in the next uh, session. Benji, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So there, there's a lot of things on the website, Francois, so I didn't have time to talk about and I'll, I'll go through the virtual labs. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot, Francois, for a very nice talk. And I think it gives a good introduction to what we want to do in the next five series of lectures. And you did a brilliant job. And thank you very much. And then the next one will be Benji. <laughs> Any closing mark, Francois, if you have something you want to say before we close? Um, no, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I think it's, very, uh, it's going to be a very interesting series. I'm looking forward for the, other two in the next few weeks and months. Yes. Right, so, so I can see it. We, we reached the uh, triple mark, more than 100 people joining. So thank you very much for joining. This has been quite impressive. I, it was more than I expected. So I really appreciate your time uh, joining this particular session and hopefully you can do that too in the next session. Uh, thank you very much and have a good evening, good morning and good day. Thank you.